Anyway, open your Bible to Matthew 6. <laughs> it is good to see everybody here. Uh, it's good for me to me to be back here. Um, spent last week in San Antonio. Met a lot of good brethren at the University Oaks Church of Christ. Had good lectureship. It was well attended and, and uh, it was encouraging. I know to me, hopefully to the church there. Uh, but I'm glad to be home. Glad to be back with you. I'm glad to be studying God's Word with you. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer this morning, and I want to look at it maybe a little deeper than I have before, I, maybe, maybe not for you, but for me, and notice some things that I think that are very important in this passage. Matthew chapter 6, beginning there in verse 7, says, When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows that you need what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Probably one of the more well-known passages of Scripture that we could, we could cite this morning. The model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. If you go over to Luke, the disciples ask Him, how should we pray? And we get this same prayer, certainly something we need to be thinking about. One author Speaking of this prayer, said what one finds here is no less than the greatest teacher's greatest sermon on his favorite topic, the kingdom of God. If prayer is important, then we should hear the greatest word on the subject out of the greatest sermon on the greatest topic spoken by the greatest teacher who ever lived. And I think there's some truth in that. We certainly find here in this passage something that we should pay attention to, something that we should think about in our own prayer life as the Lord talks to us about how to pray. And you know, on the surface, what we have is just this reminder of our utter need for God in every aspect of our lives. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us of our sins. It's a reminder to each one of us that the kingdom citizen is one who expresses absolute trust in God. And so certainly that's what you and I need to be doing. We need to depend on our God. We need to depend on His grace and His mercy and His power to provide for us those things that we so desperately need. You know, as you, as you stop and you look at the prayer, it seems to me like it's almost an interruption in the thoughts that Jesus is presenting. In the first six verses there, you have Jesus talking about Jewish traditions in regard to almsgiving and prayer. And then you come on down to verse 16. He picks up again with this idea of Jewish traditions and things the Jews are not doing quite right. But in verse 7, he begins to talk to us about the way that the Gentiles pray. And so he kind of he changes the theme a little bit, moving from these, these, Gentile, these Jewish misconceptions to these more Gentile problems. Structurally, it's a little bit different than the rest of the chapter. You get this long, positive admonition that forms the prayer itself. You don't see that in the rest of the chapter. You get the explainer verses there in verse 14 and 15. As Jesus helps us understand what he means by forgive us our debts, again, very different from the rest of the context. As a matter of fact, uh, one scholar says that if this was in modern day writing, this would have been a footnote, not because it was less important, but because it seems like it's a little bit of an interruption, information that doesn't necessarily fit with the rest of the chapter. And yet, as we begin to read it, what we find out is that it is so absolutely important for us to think about and to consider the primary thing Jesus is doing in verses 7 through 15 is, is kind of highlighting the difference in the way the Gentiles approach their gods and the way Jehovah God must be approached. And he wants us to see that there's a distinction, there's a difference, there's something else that we need to do. If you go back and you do a little bit of reading, what you'll find out is that pagans sought to manipulate their gods 
through flattery. They would call them all sorts of names and talk at length about their power and, and make a request or two at the end. And What they were trying to do in their minds was, was flatter or manipulate their gods, whoever it is they thought might be listening, into simply doing what they wanted. And I think what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 6 is don't be like them. That's not how you approach Jehovah God. That's how, not how we need to speak to Him. That's not how we need to approach Him in, with anything that we might have. As a matter of fact, I, I think you could take the prayer here and you could go back to Elijah on Mount Carmel and you can see there the prophets of Baal and how they're trying to urge their God to respond. And, and they go through all these extremes to try, to try to manipulate Him into doing what they want done. And of course, Elijah just expresses his faith in God, and God, God responds, and he does so abundantly. And so I think that's something that we need to understand as we read this prayer, but it's something that struck me this time through that I've never really thought about before, and I, I think it's very important for us to see is that this prayer kind of sums up the whole sermon. When you really stop and you think about the themes we've noticed in the sermon, you, you stop and you think about what Jesus is saying in this prayer. It, it really is a summation of the sermon. What we find out here is that the kingdom citizen must truly desire the purpose for which the kingdom is established. The kingdom citizen must fully submit to the rule of the kingdom, and then the kingdom citizen must, uh, must demonstrate allegiance to God, absolute trust in God. And I think we'll see these things this morning as we work our way through the prayer. So back in our text, notice with me, if you will, verses 7 and 8, where it says, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. And I think this is a place in the prayer where we, we have a translation that I think is unfortunate it may steer us in a direction that's different than where Jesus is going. And it has to do with this idea of vain repetitions or meaningless repetition. And so we, we see that word repetition and maybe we come away thinking that true prayer is not repetitive. That if I'm saying what I've said in other prayers again and again, or if I have a habit of saying certain things that maybe that's not how I'm supposed to pray. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here at all. You might notice the, the end of the verse, I think kind of helps us understand the beginning of the verse. He says, they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. That word that in most of our Bibles is translated as repetition might have been better translated as babble. It's to speak in a way that images the kind of speech pattern of one who stammers Use the same words again and again, one who speaks without thinking. And I think the idea that Jesus has in mind here is that idea of flattery, that idea of empty words, just saying things to be saying them, not that they're important, not that they matter, not that they really even make sense. And as we've already mentioned, this is what Gentile prayer sounded like. It was a very manipulative approach. Again, emphasizing flattery. I've got an example here of a Gentile prayer. It was written by a Roman poet about the first century, actually. He says, under Diana's protection, we pure girls and boys, we pure boys and girls, we sing of Diana. Notice the poetic usage there, the repetition that really serves no actual purpose. He says, O daughter of Latanya, greatest child of great Jove, whose mother gave birth near the Delian olive, mistress of mountains and the green groves, the secret glades and the sounding, uh, the sounding streams, you called Juno, Lucina, in childbirth pains. You called all power, powerful trivia and Luna of counterfeit daylight. Your monthly passage measures the course of the year. You fill the rustic farmer's roof with good crops. Take whatever sacred name pleases you. Be a sweet help to the people of Rome as you have been of old. And as you read that and you think about that, there's really not much of a request there other than some sort of divine favor. But listen to what he's doing. There's, there, there's no faith here. There's no trust here. 
This is, this is someone speaking to someone else whom he doesn't really have a relationship with, and he's trying to coerce or manipulate. He's trying to flatter in order to get an outcome, and it couldn't be more different from the Lord's Prayer. Most of the words in that prayer are useless and meaningless and have no value. They, they do nothing to draw the petitioner closer to the God that they are petitioning. And when you read that and then you read the simplicity of the prayer that Jesus offers, yes, he praises the Father, but he speaks to him with trust and with confidence. Very different, very different from what we see in the Gentile prayer. And so Jesus says, listen, when we're praying, we need to think about what we're saying. We need to, we need to speak to the God that we know, the God that we serve. We need to put our trust in Him. You might also notice what He says in verse 8. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I say this quite often. I want to say it again. If our concept of prayer is that of kind of praying to Santa Claus, where we're, we're talking to our favorite uncle and we're trying to get God to do what we want done, we're misunderstanding what prayer is. And I think Jesus emphasizes that. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We don't need, God does not need us to inform Him of anything. What God is seeking from us is relationship. What God is seeking from us is trust. What God is calling on us to do through prayer is to turn to Him instead of turning to others. And our prayer ought to reflect that. Our prayer ought to reflect that sort of trust, that confidence in God. And so we pray with submission and not manipulation, with allegiance and not demand, with faith and not insecurity. So different from what the Gentile world was doing. He's a loving Father that we're approaching, and we should approach Him as such. And the more and the better we understand that, the more it's going to shape our prayer life. The more it's going to change how we approach Him as we understand the relationship that God desires to have with us. Let's move into the prayer itself. Verse 9, pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's interesting to me is as you really look at this prayer, there's not a word in it that's wasted. Everything that Jesus says has purpose and meaning. This idea of hallowing your name, it's the idea of making holy. And I've got to be honest with you, I think I've misunderstood why Jesus says this for a long, long time. I've always understood this to refer to the one praying, recognizing the holiness of God, or even recognizing a call to be holy like God. But I've, I've changed my mind. I really don't think that's what's going on here. I think Jesus is doing something much more powerful than that. He's more than simply saying, I know you're holy Father, certainly He is. Certainly we should strive to be like Him. But I think there's something more going on. I want you to notice the structure of this prayer with me. And I want you to think about how these things are, are laid out. Everything in this prayer, in verses 10, 11, 12, and 13, are calls for divine action. Each statement that Jesus makes after verse 9 is a call for God to act. And what I would suggest to you is that verse 9 actually fits that same pattern. That what Jesus is doing is he's actually calling on God to act in the way that God has promised that he would act. And as a matter of fact, there's some prophetic background for this. What I'm saying is that what Jesus is saying in that prayer is, God, hallow your name. God, make your name holy. God, demonstrate your holiness for this world. Turn back with me, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel. Notice Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36. And I want you to notice with me there verse 22, because this, this idea of God making his name holy, 
is actually a familiar theme in the Old Testament. It's a familiar theme among the prophets. Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 36, and there in verse 22, the scripture says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you win. And so here's God talking about his, his willingness to bring his captive people out of, out of their captivity. He says, not for you. It's not because you're such great people. But it is for my holy name, he says. By bringing Israel out of captivity, as he had said he would do in the book of Jeremiah, and thus bringing the Messiah through them, God hallows his name among the people. Notice chapter 39 of the same book, chapter 39 of Ezekiel. We see the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 39. As a matter of fact, this is kind of scattered all through Ezekiel. Notice with me verse 27. He says, when I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. Sanctified, made holy, hallowed. I will be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. Verse 28, then they will know that I am the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again to their own, their own land and I will leave none of them any longer. I will not hide my face from them any longer for I will have poured out my spirit in the house of Israel, declares God. And so again, here we have God acting, God acting in a manner consistent with his promises. And in doing that, what we have is God making his name holy, showing the world the holiness of his name. Turn over to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9. And we'll be in Daniel chapter 9 for just a moment because I think Daniel really helps us to, to understand what we're seeing here and helps us to understand this whole concept of, of God's name being hallowed. Now, I think Daniel helps us see how God hallows his name. Notice there Daniel chapter 9 at verse 19. Daniel's praying to God. He says, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people, listen to this, are called by your name. I think Daniel 9 is very helpful in understanding this concept of, of, of God's name being hallowed, God acting in a way as to make his name holy. Because what you've got going on here in Daniel 9, Daniel has, has been reading Jeremiah and he's been doing the math. And he's figured out that the 70 years that God had promised this captivity would last is drawing to a close. As a matter of fact, we're probably in year 69 as we're reading this particular prayer. And Daniel's concerned. Daniel's concerned because he's afraid the people are still sinful and the people are still wicked. And he believes that if the people are still sinful and wicked, if the people haven't repented, that God won't bring them back out of the captivity. But how's that going to look? Well, it will appear as if God is not keeping his promises. And so Daniel is praying to God regarding his covenant. And look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who, who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your prophets, the, the, your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. And he goes on and talks about the captivity and what God has done. Verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. God, please forgive us. God, remember your covenant. 
God, please do what you have said you would do. Verse 11, indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. But he goes on and he asks again and again for God to forgive them and to be righteous. Notice verse 16, O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. And so Daniel has this concern, and it's interesting the way he's praying. Daniel is not saying, God, I've been in captivity long enough, please come get me out. That is not what Daniel is. This is not a selfish prayer. He's not even saying your people have suffered enough. Please release them. It's not even selfish on the national scale. That's not what Daniel's doing here. Daniel is looking at God and God's promise and the condition of the people. And he's saying, God, we deserve everything we're getting. We deserve everything that you've done to us. We deserve this captivity. We deserve it because we're sinners, but. But you made a promise. And your promise was to return us. And God, if you don't keep your promise, who will you be? He keeps talking about the, the city. He talks there in verse 16 about the city and the mountain. He talks there in verse 19 about the people and the city. I think that's interesting because the vision that Daniel's going to have in Daniel chapter 9 has to do with rebuilding the city. And what we find out is that until Jerusalem is rebuilt, Messiah doesn't come. And so when Daniel's talking about about the holiness of the city, when Daniel is talking about restoring the city, he's not just saying, hey, I'd like a house. And a house in a nice town would be nice, and I'd like a wall around it. That's not what Daniel's saying there. Again, there's nothing selfish in this prayer. What he's saying is, God, keep your promise. God, act as you said you would act. And, And so we see that God hallows his name. Through righteousness, through forgiveness, through justice. But I think primarily what we see in both Daniel and in Ezekiel, and you'll find a few places in Isaiah, and I think what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6, is God, hallow your name, act in a way consistent with your plan. Carry out your purpose. Go back over to Matthew chapter 6 and see if that doesn't fit. Pray then in this way, verse 9. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Brethren, the theme of this prayer so far is the same as the theme of Daniel's prayer. Now Jesus isn't concerned about a people in captivity, at least not in the sense that Daniel is. No, but Daniel was anticipating a promise of God. And as unlikely as it looked, he's begging God, keep your promise. Why? So you can be the God I believe in. And what is Jesus saying? God, carry out your will. To do what? To create this kingdom that Jesus is preaching about. To form this people over which Jesus is to be the head. To bring his church into existence. What a way to think about God. Hallowed be your name is not flattery. It's a request that only God can carry out. And I think it ties into verse 10. You know, for a long time, I've heard brethren kind of argue about whether or not we ought to say what verse 10 says. I remember when I, I played sports, I don't know why we pray this particular prayer before a Sports endeavor, I don't know what it has to do with sports, but every game I ever played growing up, we all got in a circle and we said the Lord's Prayer. And I remember for a long time being told, don't do that, don't say that. And and the reason we were told that is your kingdom come, right? And and we were looking at that through through the premillennial question, and we had of our, our friends and our neighbors who believe that the kingdom hasn't come in any sense, that the church and the kingdom are, are separate entities, and so the kingdom has come, it's visible, it's manifested in the church, and so if we're saying your kingdom come, then we're acting as if that hasn't happened. 
Can I say I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here? That I think Jesus is saying so much, something so much bigger than that. Now, is it wise for us to be in public praying this prayer? Perhaps not because of those misconceptions. But for you and I, in our, in our private prayer life, I, I think what Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 10 is something we ought to be saying. I think what he's asking for, what he's referring to here, is something that you and I ought to be concerned with. First of all, I want you to notice something with me. This, this word kingdom is broader than church. As a matter of fact, what kingdom refers to is the sphere of one's rule. Well, what is the sphere of, one, of God's rule? What is God's domain? Everything that is. Everything that is. So there's a sense in which God's kingdom has always been, has always existed. Now, I think obviously Jesus is talking about something more specific than that. And, and I think what you'll find is you kind of look at that idea of kingdom throughout Scripture. Sometimes it doesn't refer to the church at all, does it? 2 Peter 2 and verse 11, 1 and verse 11 seems to me to be talking about heaven. But still in this, this generalized way, as you kind of read about this, this kingdom concept, and you move from the Old Testament to the New, it, it seems like there is a narrowing of the concept. It, it seems like there is a narrowing of the concept. And, and today, right now, in this dispensation of God's revelation, the church is the visible manifestation of God's kingdom. I think we can say that. I, I think we can say that without being overly simplistic and so here we are we're a part of the church and so we're a part of this expression of God's rule we're part of this expression of God's rule and I think there's something important there for us to think about first of all who can pray this prayer your kingdom come your will be done and by the way I think that's a little parallelism where he's explaining what he means by the first statement through the second statement. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Brother, if I'm going to pray this prayer, I've got to submit to God first. If I'm going to pray along with Jesus, let me tell you what I've got to do. I've got to get rid of self, and I've got to hit my knees, and I've got to bow before my God, and I've got to submit to him. This is not a prayer for the marginal Christian to pray. Your will be done. Something else I want to consider with you about the church. The church is here. The church exists, and that is obvious. But brethren, God's purpose for the church has not been completed yet. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to think about this. God was doing more with the church than just establishing it. There's more to the church and the church's history and the church's purpose than just Acts chapter 2 and 3,000 people entering in and then we model that again and again and again and again and again. There's more to the church than that. As a matter of fact, what we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that there's an end time purpose for the church. There's something that Jesus is doing even now as king of the kingdom, as head of the church. He is working and he is active notice this verse 23 or let's go back up to verse 22 it says for as in Adam all die so also in Christ all will be made alive but each in his own order Christ the first fruits after that those who are Christ at his coming then comes the end now listen to this when he, that's Christ, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now somebody wants to come up after services and say, Sean, exactly what is Jesus doing right now? Let me go ahead and tell you, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know what all this looks like. But here's what I know. There's an enemy that's still being defeated. God is still working through Christ and through the church to accomplish something. Notice verse 27. For he, that's the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, that's Jesus' feet. But when he, the Father, says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepting, uh, accepted who put all things in subjection to him. So, so you know, Christ is head over all except the Father. That's what he wants us to know. Verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, 
then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God, and here's the phrase I want, so that God may be all in all. What's that talking about? You got the Father, he sent his Son to establish this kingdom. He's given him the right of reign and rule over that kingdom. There's enemies to that kingdom. And his son, in whatever way, and I think partially through us and through the preaching of the gospel that you and I can do, is, is fighting against that enemy, and it will be fully and finally defeated at some future point. We don't know when, but we know it will be. And when that happens, the kingdom will have accomplished the goal for which God created the kingdom. And the one who is king now, Jesus, the Son of God, will hand the kingdom back to the Father. And Paul says, so that God, so that the Father may be all in all. If you go trace that phrase, all in all, through the New Testament, I don't have time to do it this morning, but you can do it. I think what you're going to find is that that is an expression of divine sovereignty. That what he is saying is that something needs to happen. Something is going to happen that is going to once and for all fully and finally demonstrate the absolute, complete sovereignty of our Father, our God. Oh. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I want you to notice how selfless this prayer is. Jesus doesn't have a wish list. And don't get me wrong. Can I take my supplications, my concerns, my cares to my God? Absolutely I can. But I think this prayer ought to, ought to, ought to shape and form how we think about that. What it is that we're so concerned about that we want the creator of the universe to, to interject himself who it is that we're concerned about, because I can tell you who Jesus prayed for. I can tell you what he was praying for. It was for the purpose, the Father's purpose to be carried out, which implies a willingness to participate in whatever way is necessary. Brother, can I pray your kingdom come, your will be done? I believe I can. I just need to understand what I'm saying. And a big part of what I'm saying is, I submit. I, 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 I'm pledging myself to the Father and to His will so that I can say, Your will be done. Go back and read Daniel 9. Isn't that what Daniel's saying? God, whatever role you got for me, I'm happy to do it. I'm going to submit whether it's here in Babylon or whether I get back to go back to Jerusalem. But God, I want Your name to be glorified. I want Your name to be magnified. Not mine, not Daniel. Isn't that how we ought to be praying? God, I want you to be glorified. And if you can be glorified in my life, then so much the better. But, but God, I, I don't need to be glorified. It's not about me. It's not about what I think I might want today. It's not about what I've determined would make me happy. It's about serving you. It's about submitting. It's about your name being hallowed which will happen fully and finally when the righteous are redeemed and when the wicked are punished. Somebody says, Sean, it's been 30 minutes. We're going word by word through the rest of this prayer? <laughs> I don't think we have to now because we've set the framework. And it seems to me that everything Jesus is going to say after this fits that framework. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, if all we see in that is, Jesus, don't let me go hungry, I think we miss the whole prayer, don't we? How do we go from God, your will be done, and whatever is required of me to facilitate that, I give myself wholeheartedly to it. And by the way, I'd like lunch. Does, does that even make sense? I, I don't think it does. I think we've got another unfortunate translation. As a matter of fact, that word translated daily, I think in nearly every English translation, no one has found it anywhere in Greek writing except Matthew and Luke, which is kind of interesting. What that means is we really don't know what it means. The translation daily came in the Tyndale Bible. 
And the way he got daily was looking at Saxon translations of, of the passage. He wasn't even looking at the Greek because he couldn't find anywhere else to define the term. And so this idea that, that what Jesus is saying is make sure we eat every day, it's based on this one word that's so questionable. Like Every scholar I looked at goes, eh, we're not real sure what it means. Most of them agree that what it means is sufficient. Sufficient. Now let's think about that for just a second. What is he praying for? Is he saying, God, I, I want your will to be done, but I, I don't want to be hungry? Or is he praying that whatever is needful for us to do the work that God has get, given us to do, that God provide us with what we need to do it? I think that fits the context a lot better, doesn't it? I think that fits the context a lot better. You know, we might go over to Matthew 6 and say, well, God promises that he'll feed us over Matthew 6, does he? Is that the promise in Matthew 6, that God is going to feed us? I think he just says that we're worth more than the birds. Matter of fact, verse 31, do not worry then saying, what will we eat and what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But... Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Brethren, God's people have gone hungry plenty in the service of God. But God gave them what they needed to serve him. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And notice again the spiritual nature of the other two requests. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in case we're confused about what that means, verse 14 and 15 explain it, doesn't it? He's talking about sin. God, forgive me when I sin against you as I forgive others when they sin against me. In other words, as I learn to be merciful, please, Lord, be merciful to me. In other words, God, don't be unholy. Have you ever thought about it that way? That if God has one standard for his people and another standard for others, if God has one standard for holiness for himself and for the world, but then allows us to behave like hypocrites, then God is not holy. If God will forgive me when I am unforgiving, then who is God? What value is there in his forgiveness? Your kingdom come, your will be done, hallowed be your name. And then he says, deliver us from evil. And that's a, that's a tough one for us, isn't it? As we go back over to Matthew chapter 6, and there in verse 13, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Again, I, I think what he's doing is, is that, that second clause defines the first. In other words, God, I put my trust in you. I'm going wherever you would lead me, so deliver me from evil. It's not that he's afraid that God will lead him to temptation. That's not the idea. But there's this recognition that, that I am completely helpless in your hands, Lord. Wherever you take me, that's where I'm going. Please, God, take me to the right place, as I know you will. Again, hallowed be your name. A God who's acting in such a way as to make his name holy is a God that I can trust, is a God that I can depend on, is a God that I can turn to so that I can know, so that I can know. Which way to turn and how to live. And so the prayer sums up the sermon. I mentioned this in the introduction. I want to come back to it real quick. How do we hallow God's name? You know, again, I think the prayer is a, a petition to God to act. God, hallow your name, I believe is what Jesus is saying there in the prayer. But that next line, that next phrase, that next request, your kingdom come, your will be done, it implies us joining with God in that. So, so how do you and I, how do you and I live in a way that hallows God's name? That's Matthew chapter 5, isn't it? That, that's the Beatitudes and those who are blessed in the Beatitudes. 
That's the salt and the light, those who show God's character into this world. That, that's those, we, we looked at all that chapter, didn't we? We looked at all those different verses and, and all the different ways that we demonstrate godliness and righteousness and holiness and mercy and grace in this world. He sums all that up in Matthew 5 and verse 48. And what does he tell us in Matthew 5 and verse 48? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How do I hallow God's name in this world? I behave like God would behave. Am I going to be perfect at that? Highly doubtful. But that should be my goal. That should be what I'm striving for. Chapter 6, how do we hallow God's name? How do we, how, how do we, how do we carry this out in reality? Well, what did we notice that the Jews were guilty of? Primarily hypocrisy in chapter 6. The Gentiles' manipulation in chapter 6. What is Jesus calling us to do? Surrender. Surrender. For this reason I say to you, verse 25, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then, of course, we're going to get to chapter 7 by the end of the year. And what do we find there? Trust the judgment of God. Trust the judgment of God. All these things he's put here in this prayer so that we might understand them. I sure appreciate your good attention this morning. It's such a powerful piece of Scripture here that shares with us these, these very important principles not just about who we are, but about who God is. And brother, I can't overstate the importance of that. If I'm going to understand who I need to be in God's kingdom, then I'm going to have to understand who God is. If I'm going to reflect God's character, God's grace, and God's mercy into this world that he has created, then I'm going to have to know about God's grace, God's character, and God's mercy. And, and I think Jesus makes this very clear to us. This is what he wants us to see. A holy God who's going to carry out His will in righteousness whom we can trust and whom we can turn to. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, I want you to think about that God. Why not surrender to Him? Receive the forgiveness that He and He alone can give you. The promise that He and He alone can make. Maybe you've done those things and yet you've strayed. Why not turn back to Him? Why not beg his forgiveness based upon your repentance? He's faithful and just to do so. If we can help you in any way this morning, why don't you let us know right now while we stand and while we sing.